So this year we're celebrating 30 years of the Urquhart Butterfly Garden, um, project which began 33 years ago um, in the early 1990s and has kind of evolved over the years. Most of the most of the serious work on the garden was done early, the installation of the, um, the stones and the design of the garden, um, the grading of, of, uh, of the bank and the Desjardins Canal. But work is currently ongoing. Um, each year, um, there's a lot of planting that needs to be done, uh, a lot of planning. Um, we'll get to, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of recent beaver damage. So there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of pruning and replanting each year in the garden. Um, so the, the driving force behind the garden is, is of course, Joanna Chapman. Here she is last year, uh, 2022 Year of the Garden Hero uh, Award recipient. This is Nancy Wiley, who many of you will know, also a very active member of the Naturalist Club. So um, I actually wanted to read some stuff that Joanna sent me uh, about the formation of the Butterfly Garden. It's kind of more inspiring to hear it from, from in, in her words than, than to kind of paraphrase it. So I've got a picture of a giant spalto here. Joanna says, the Urquhart Butterfly Garden in Dundas was initiated because of, of a very unique experience at the end of September, some 33 plus years ago on Ca Cross Street next to downtown Dundas. Some of you will recall that uh, Joanna formerly had a bookstore there, Chapman Books in Dundas. It involved a giant small tail butterfly. Um, the tale is much too long to recount here, so we'll get to the details. We'll get to the point. The butterfly is now a fairly common sight in Dundas, but was not at that time. I believe that everything happens for a reason and I searched for answers. It seemed that something about the environment was changing. At the time, I wasn't, I wasn't a scientist and I do not even recall whether I knew about global weather change. Herbicides and pesticides were on most gardens, but my front garden was wild and even had a pond. Some of you will recall in the front of uh, Chapman Books there, there was a pond to the left of the entrance. The butterfly had found the one plant for many blocks that she could lay her single egg upon. What happened had really seemed, uh, what happened had really touched me. It came to me that I, I was inspired to start a butterfly garden in Dundas, free from herbicides and pesticides, a garden with a mix of native and non-native plants to attract butterflies at every stage of their life, a demonstration and educational project to show what chemical free gardening was like and what could be attracted. So Joanna wanted to so wanted really everyone to be able to have the experience of attracting wildlife to a yard. Um, she may not be the first person to, to have this wish, but um, this was the first municipal uh, butterfly garden in Canada. So she transformed her wish into something that, that really was a first in Canada. Um, and now in the last, I don't know, five or 10 years, the interest in native plant gardening and pollinators has really exploded. But at the time it was kind of Maybe more, maybe more niche, maybe more amongst us more serious naturalists. But now everybody, many, many people are interested in native plant garden and in attracting wildlife to their properties. Um, so she continues, the raising of funds took three years together with the assistance of many groups and individuals, especially the talented young architect, Brian McKibben, who designed, coordinated and supervised the construction. So moving on, uh, the, garden, the garden is named for Fred and Nora Urquhart. Um, Fred was an entomologist uh, who studied, who got his PhD from the University of Toronto. And him and his wife spent nearly 40 years trying to unravel the mystery of where monarch butterflies spent the winter. Um, up until then, nobody really knew for certain. The trail kind of disappeared in Southern Texas and Northern Mexico. And um, uh, through their citizen science research of tagging butterflies and enlisting volunteers to to really just search the volcanic plateau in Mexico. Um, one of their volunteers found uh, in Michoacan a site where the butterflies winter and really the rest is history. Since then it's many people have been there and visited and it's kind of a well, it, it's kind of one of those things that we just accept as being known, but for a long time, it was quite a mystery. Um, so for those who haven't visited the garden, you may associate it with the landmarks that are around it. Uh, the Air Force Club in Dundas, the Desjardins Canal immediately to the east. Many birders have visited the canal in winter to look for wintering waterfowl. Uh, the garden is in Centennial Park at the west end of the Desjardins Canal, immediately adjacent to the Air Force Club. 
um, there's a bright sign welcoming visitors. And as you can see, I, I use this slide on purpose. It's a winter slide of the garden. M maybe not the most uh, beautiful photograph, but you can see Coots Drive. You can see vehicles passing. So um, it, it's kind of one of the, maybe one of the pros of, of the garden is it's it's not a large space, but it hosts an immense, uh, an immense number and diversity of wildlife. Um, and as one of the aims of the garden is to, it's kind of to inspire people that in a small space, they can attract and uh, host many species. Um, this isn't, this is actually bigger than most of our properties, but the garden beds are the size of something you might have in your own backyard. So the garden is located, uh, you can see at the, in between Centennial Park in Dundas and the Desjardins Canal. Close up here, there, there's, um, here are all the garden beds. So I'll read another statement from Joanna here. So the project is at the end of the old Desjardins Canal in Dundas. The land is now owned by the city of Hamilton. The bank has been regraded and planted with shrubs. There are six raised beds, approximately 75 by 35 feet, planted with shrubs and plants. The project also includes three natural areas which have been left to regenerate. The interpretive kiosk was erected in 1996 and contains a wealth of information about the garden. In the fall of 2014, the UBG expanded by adding a strip of land beside the canal. This space connects the adjacent natural land, Canal Park. So immediately to the right of the, the large red circle there, you can see what looks like a strip of mowed grass um, alongside the moving company. It's actually now extensively planted with native vegetation um, and it connects to the, the Coots to Escarpment project with Canal Park, which, uh, um, which is part of the effort to connect natural lands from Coots Paradise up to the Niagara Escarpment. Um, and it serves as a, as a hiking trail and as a corridor for wildlife. Um, we've been fortunate to have the assistance of the Dower Fund of the Hampton Community Foundation, which pays for a gardener throughout the summer and educational program, as well as some replenished plantings. Throughout the years, the Urquhart Butterfly Garden has been very fortunate to have been helped by Michelle Sharp. Um, so here's an early photo of the garden. Apologize for the quality, but you can see um, the heavy work was done early, of course, the design and the installation. But initially it was very, it was maybe not very welcoming to insects because it's sitting right on the bank of the canal where the prevailing westerly winds would just kind of blast across the garden. So a lot of these foundation shrubs were planted um, and cedars were planted around the garden in order to form a, a sanctuary from the wind and the elements where insect diversity could flourish. So mention the kiosk. Kiosk installed in 1996 and has been updated several times since with new graphics and new photos. Um, most of these photos were taken by Michelle Sharp and uh, the, the graphic design was done by her as well. Um, all of these photos were taken in the garden. So you can see some very common and familiar butterflies and some very spectacular and rare butterflies have been seen in the butterfly garden. Um, we'll get to these a bit later. Many other visitors frequent the garden. There's, there's insects and birds, reptiles, um, see on the bottom left, some moths. So even in a small space, there's, there's quite a biodiversity. Again, the focus of the butterfly garden is on the monarch butterfly, um, advocating for their conservation. It's a huge conservation issue, um, the decline of the monarch butterfly and all of the perils that they face uh, through their migration and habitat loss and pesticide use. So there's a big focus of the kiosk and the panels are talking about the monarch butterfly, how to identify them, how to attract them to their yard, to your backyard, um, advocating for the planting of milkweed, of course, how to tell them from, from the similar viceroy. Uh, the garden serves as a, a teaching garden as well. There's an education program uh, there every summer. Admission is, is always free. Um, often there is an nature interpreter on duty. Um, in the past that has been myself, but this year it will be somebody else. Um, usually daily, mid-morning to noon or early afternoon, most weekdays, uh, there's somebody there. So don't hesitate to ask questions. It's a pretty awesome photo by Michelle Sharp that I've always really enjoyed. The garden also um, is known for having year-round interest, um, not just within the garden itself, um, but views of the canal and views overhead for migrating birds. Um, 
um, and we leave the garden, basically, aside from some light pruning and a little bit of touch up and some weeding in the fall, uh, the garden is intentionally left as is until the spring because it serves as habitat for uh, butterflies and other insects and invertebrates that might be there. So it provides year round interest in terms of, of plant interest and but it also provides year round habitat because we don't go through and sort of make it look all tidy and rake it up and uh, in the way that, excuse me, you might think of a manicured garden. So here's a view of the garden in the spring, some of the lilacs blooming. Um, you can see it looks quite a bit different than the old photo from the 90s. Um, the concept of the garden is really fourfold, um, the design of the garden. One, as you can see, there's, there's a foundational planting of trees and shrubs, um, some of them, of them native and some of them not. Um, this is to provide cover, nesting habitat for birds. Um, so the second one would be uh, planting of perennials. Uh, there's native and non-native perennials. No pesticides are used uh, regardless of, of native or non-native. So this is to provide, um, again, cover, but more sort of steady habitat in the garden. Um, the other one is, is annuals are planted. Um, some of these annuals are native, some of them are not. Some of them are, are food plants. Um, things like a dill is planted as a host plant for black swallowtail um, caterpillars. And the fourth one is the garden is allowed to do sort of some of its own creation um, as an inspiration for those who might have a sort of a more free hand in their garden or sort of a nod to like let nature do its thing. Um, of course, anything that's invasive or potentially harmful, like there's uh, poison ivy or anything that along the trails is, is pulled out. Um, so there's no worry to visitors, but along, along the edges of the, the rocks and through sections of the garden, the garden's allowed to, to do its own thing. Um, so the garden serves as, as a template for design for what people might choose to do in their own setting. There's very manicured looking uh, plantings of annuals sort of foundation plantings. And then there's these sort of boulevards of wild. Um, and, and it really comes together for a, a unified look. Um, we'll get back to that in a moment. As you can see, this is the garden in the summer. There's these kind of intentional plantings of, of perennials, these purple cone flowers. And then there's this element of just, of just wild to the garden as well, um, because these layers of plantings allow for more insect biodiversity. So the, the garden has a summer education series, usually focusing on, on the height of summer um, uh, when insects and butterflies are most abundant. Typically the summer education series is staggered where there's a sort of generic identification tour um, and then a more specialized event. You can see last summer that was jumbled a bit, but typically there'll be a generic like come, just for a tour of the garden and whatever presents itself. We'll look at birds, butterflies, sort of what the day gives. There's always something to see. Uh, but then there's, there's guests that'll speak on spiders, dragonflies, um, bees. So depending on, on interest, all of the events are free. They're all an hour, an hour and a half long. So tour of the garden and a, and a focus on, on, uh, on insects or butterflies or what have you. So here's a group last summer, um, two summers ago, I believe. This is me uh, talking to a group. Again, some hilarious angles of me in the garden. <laughs> but yeah, so here's, here's the kiosk, the one end of the garden, uh, showcasing the um, focus on monarch butterflies and other butterflies. And you can see again, the sort of concept of the garden on, on, on the one hand, this is the sort of like wild look to the garden. On the other hand, there's some very familiar plants in the garden, uh, purple coneflower on the left beside this woman with the green backpack, sort of not flowering anymore, but there's some wild bergamot, uh, black-eyed Susan, plants that many of us probably have in our gardens. This is uh, uh, the same as this photo, but looking in the other direction. The garden also has a foundational planting of, of uh, butterfly bush. See on the right, this is probably in 
late July on the right. Some of the butterfly bushes are just beginning to flower. Some, there's a bed typically full of zinnia in the garden. Um, zinnia are basically invincible until it like, gets really, really cold. So they'll flower right through October. And uh, as Bill was talking about, we have an early spring this year. We often have very warm falls in recent years. So there's often butterflies active right into October. And this section of the garden towards the canal where all the zinnia are is often one of the last places where there'll be adults nectaring. So a look at the garden, as I mentioned, year round interest. Uh, this is probably in very early spring, um, Eastern red bud tree, which we'll see later in flower on the right there. Um, yeah, you can see aside from some, some basic pruning and some stuff kind of being cleared, this, is, this may actually be after, no, this is before the garden sort of comes to life in the spring and before everything's kind of cleaned or whatever, but, it's just kind of left to its own devices through the winter so that we're not killing the insect diversity there. Um, and as I mentioned recently, there's been some beaver damage. This was highlighted in the wood duck. There's an article by Joanna. Um, and I say damage, but I don't think the beavers have really done any permanent damage. I think they, they've, they've done some excellent pruning for the garden, but most of these shrubs will just sprout back and grow back this summer. So they took a fragrant sumac right to the ground. Um, they, did, they did kill a few um, the trees, but, but I think even these, like some of the maples, they'll just re-sprout. So it, it's an interesting look. A lot of the bank has kind of been cleared by these beavers, so it'll be a different look in the spring, but most of it will sprout, re-sprout and grow back. Luckily, they haven't made their way into the garden. You can see there's a, cornucopia of woody material in the garden that they could take to the ground and that might be a different story but for now they're they're really just kind of um, shuffling deck chairs on the on the bank here all right so before i get to some of the wildlife in the garden i wanted to mention a few of the photographers i noticed some of the photographers who contribute regularly to the website and to the photo contest i noticed their names in attendance tonight um, so I've been mentioned Mark Williams, uh, Ken Kerr, as I mentioned, Michelle Sharp, um, Ted Jez, uh, Ron Rowan, big interest in spiders in the garden. I think there's a few photos in here by Doug Welch. Um, I took all these photos from the website. So if you're interested, um, they're all on urquhartbutterfly.com. There's a wealth of photos there. Um, so these can be revisited at any time. So this is a fascinating photo by Ken Kerr. A lot of the photo photographers that visit the garden are interested in macro photography. Um, so they get some really, really stunning and jarring photos up close of insects. There's a praying mantis eating a katydid. Um, a lot of spiders in the garden, especially in late summer, um, sort of July and August. Into September, as, as the garden gets really dense, right along the path on the edges of the garden, there's typically quite a diversity of spiders. It's often these banded garden spiders. Um, it's a photo by Ted Jez. I think this is a candy striped spider. Uh, lots of grass spiders. Uh, spiders aren't your thing. Uh, <laughs> avert your eyes for a couple more slides. It gets pretty intense. It's a lot of crab spiders. Um, I don't have a photo, but there's quite a bit of assassin bugs in the garden as well. Um, if you look closely on, especially on the cone flowers and the things like Joe Pye weed in the garden. There's often crab spiders and assassin bugs hiding. Once in a while, you can see one of them capture a butterfly. It's really quite striking, small spider with a huge butterfly. And maybe not what you want to see in a butterfly garden, but it's, it's, it's part of the life there. Um, so yeah, there's, there's crab spiders lurking everywhere. Um, one end of the garden, we've got a patch of dog bane that uh, try to keep try to keep kind of in control. Dogbane can really run wild and, and grow in big patches. Maybe not ideal for a, for a backyard garden, but it's there intentionally because it attracts dogbane beetles, um, beautiful iridescent beetle. There's, uh, there's wood roaches in the garden, which make interesting photo subjects. So yeah, like uh, when you think of a butterfly garden, people think of flowers and butterflies and birds, but there's quite a diversity of insects there. and um, if you really sort of stop and look closely. 
Uh, late in the summer, there's a lot of dragonflies. I find that the garden really isn't wonderful for, for like a big number of dragonflies, but we've had some dragonfly talks there and the diversity is, is pretty good, especially sort of later in the summer as dragonfly numbers and dragonfly migration and movements pick up. A lot of bees, solitary bees, bumblebees. The garden is especially full of wasps, uh, not the uh, sting you scary kind, although they're around, but the, the, the garden is full of a lot of interesting native wasps, um, especially in the big patches of mint towards the canal. There's often golden digger wasps and larger wasps, um, potter wasps, those are black and white marked ones. There's quite a, I think this is a big headed fly. It's a big diversity of flies. So what I'm trying to get at is there's sort of, there's, there's quite a diversity of wildlife there and, and there's something there for every interest. Oops. And around the garden, um, it's a border of shrubs and there's a row, see another photo of the garden, sort of um, from the parking lot. There's a row of pine trees there. And in the summer, there's often a big hatch of cicadas. And you can see the cicadas emerging on the, on the trunks of the pine trees there. Um, occasionally it's very spectacular. Occasionally it's coincided with some of our Saturday walks. And there's been like dozens and dozens and dozens of cicadas hatching out all over the trees, all over the lawn. Um, they're really quite striking when they first hatch. So reptiles and amphibians, uh, much less frequently seen in the garden. Um, we're a little bit sort of isolated from larger patches of habitat, but there's often garter snakes. On occasion, there's milk snake and brown snake, uh, painted turtle. Uh, there's often along the banks of the canal, you can see frogs, uh, leopard frog, every once in a while. I think maybe just once we've had a, a tree frog in the garden. So birds, many people when they think of the canal or the butterfly garden, they think of the canal, ducks and geese. But uh, as I mentioned, the, the garden's planted to attract nesting songbirds. There's frequently uh, one or two pairs of catbirds in the garden around, often yellow warblers. Cedar waxwings are frequent visitors because the garden is planted heavily with berry shrubs and, and uh, fruit bearing trees, mulberries and uh, cornelian cherry and, and stuff like that. Goldfinches might be the most frequent songbird in the garden. Um, there's a mass planting of cup plants in the garden uh, that blooms in late summer and uh, really lingers through the fall with seed heads. There's often dozens of goldfinches right along the trail. They're often very, uh, what's the word? They're often very brazen. They'll kind of linger on the seeds as people walk by. Hummingbirds present through the garden throughout the summer, but especially into migration in September. It's often a handful, three or four hummingbirds very reliably seen in the garden. We do have a planting of cardinal flower. I will see, hopefully it, 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 it sort of comes and goes, but hopefully we can get a big planting of salvia or cardinal flower um, this year. You may notice that a lot of the photos, especially as we get into butterflies, are on budlia, on butterfly bush, uh, which we use extensively in the garden for now. Um, I think our, our winters are still still cold enough that it hasn't become an invasive species, but um, I know throughout most of the US, it's kind of a big problem as an invasive species. So it will be something to watch in the butterfly garden, sort of not to allow to go to seed, um, sort of prune the tops off in the fall. But a lot of them are planted right close to the edge of the garden, um, of the garden beds along the rocks, um, kind of encourage visitors to stay on the trail and, and off the rocks. Some of them are loose and wobbly and kind of just want people to not wander into the garden beds. And, and for this, we want to bring access to, to butterflies and birds close to the garden edge so people can see them. So a lot of photos are on Budlia, but um, th there's quite a few other species of flowers planted there that, and hummingbirds most often will be down low, uh, frequently frequenting the salvia or the uh, cardinal flowers. offering pretty spectacular views. 
there's some big black walnut trees along the banks of the canal. Sometimes there's turkey vultures or red-tailed hawks there. Um, often there's a few American crows. So I mentioned the photo contest in Canal Park. I'll get more to the photo contest, but this is one of the one of the entries. Pretty awesome photo of a Cooper's hawk and a red-tailed hawk at Canal Park, just flying up the canal. There's red-tailed hawks that nest in the area, and Cooper's hawks frequent the woods on the other side of Spencer Creek, so they're often around. Uh, green herons, awesome photo of green heron. I noticed it was in the wood duck, in the section on the sort of photo contest winners and other interesting shots. They're often in the in the end of the canal, the west end of the canal, right by the garden. It's kind of some shallows there where the creek runs in along the bank. Um, and they're often there. They're just not always easy to see. This one was very cooperative. Kingfishers are almost always around up and down the canal and into the west end of Coots Paradise. Um, as I mentioned, throughout the winter, especially, but all seasons, the canal is awesome for water birds. It often stays open to the colder months. There's often one or two pie-billed grebes, uh, wood duck. There's almost always mergansers in the canal uh, through the fall and winter months into the spring. Common and uh, hooded mergansers, mostly hooded mergansers. This is a hooded merganser here, often on the, I guess, the south side of the canal, kind of where all the branches overhang. There's often a few dozen hooded mergansers kind of lurking in there. Really awesome bird, really great for photography. Common merganser, this is maybe my favorite photo from the canal area, not from the garden, but it's taken by Mark Williams, ring-billed gull trying to, trying to pirate a fish from a common merganser in the canal. Yeah, even, even though like we're all very familiar, many of us are very familiar with the canal and, and the ducks and the geese that are there. There's often high turnover there, um, and there's always something interesting to see. In the winter months, in the morning, a lot of the waterfowl will, will sort of come into roost in the evening and, and leave in the morning, sort of offering a chance to, to sort through what's there and see some turnover in the birds. A lot of mallards, a lot of uh, other puddle ducks. So I mentioned mammals as well. Uh, we saw the rabbit earlier looking at the interpretive sign. There's often a few rabbits around. Um, uh, kind of live in harmony with the rabbits. They, uh, there's often, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There's often a few baby rabbits around. And, and while they do some damage to the plantings in the garden, it's, they, they don't really like to destroy the garden. And a lot of people love coming to the garden and seeing these little baby rabbits. So. Um, the bigger issue, I don't have a photo of it, but there was a mink in the garden a year or two ago that, that did a lot of damage to, uh, to the wildlife there. Um, I think it actually made off with one of the baby rabbits. Um, I think it ate one of the nesting birds. Um, it, it really went in on the wildlife in the garden. So um, uh, we don't mind the rabbits and the squirrels. Chipmunks are a big fixture, um, often on the cut plants on the side of the trail. Um, always with a mouthful. So, all right, um, butterflies is what the butterfly garden is known for. I mentioned the UB, UBG kiosk and sign. It highlights butterfly families. Uh, there's brushfoots. Uh, most of our familiar butterflies are kind of in these three families here. Brushfoots are sort of monarchs and all the orange butterflies that we're familiar with. Um, swallowtails and sulfurs and whites. These might be the butterflies that most of us know, but we also get quite a few skippers and hair streaks and blues. Before I get into the butterflies, um, if you're interested in insects or butterflies, um, there's a lot of excellent resources. Online, there's of course, or as a phone app or as a, online as a website, there's iNaturalist um, where you can upload photos and um, People will identify them for you, the app itself or other folks, if you're not sure. So you can learn identification in real time by submitting your photos. Um, there's also bug guide. Uh, most of us, if we're getting into insects, don't really know 
the non-familiar insects. There's such a dizzying diversity and a lot of interesting stuff. Um, so it's good to sort of source out help um, when identifying stuff. Um, there's a Royal Ontario Museum, a Ron Guide to Butterflies in Ontario, the cover that's pictured here. Um, any of the guides by Jeffrey Glassberg are excellent. This, the Swift Guide to Binoculars, uh, to Butterflies. He previously had Butterflies Through Binoculars. There's a Peterson Guide to Moths. There's also an author, Heather Holm, who uh, has three or four excellent books on pollinators and pollinator habitat. She has one on bees. Uh, garden pollinators. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in butterflies and other insects, I would say that this is the sort of core for guides and a bug guide and eye naturalist are sort of the core resources if you're looking to go online. Um, Brushfoot's uh, named for the reduced forelimbs on the males. Uh, butterflies, of course, have six legs as all insects do, but the males look like they have four. So if you ever see a photo of a, a monarch or a viceroy and a flower, and it looks like it just has four legs, um, it's a good chance it's a male. We do occasionally get a buckeye pictured here. Um, the garden, before I get into butterflies, I will say the garden serves as, as a great spot to look for rare butterflies. Um, sort of in these stray butterflies that come into the area late in the summer, and we get like a really hot August or September, we'll get stray butterflies immigrating in from the United States. Um, and they kind of spread across the landscape. They might, they might concentrate in, along the lake shore or in natural areas with a lot of flowers. But if you kind of look at the landscape, there's, there's only certain spots where there's concentrations of flowering plants. Um, and, and the garden serves as one of them. We're, we're fairly close to one of the Great Lakes and it's a big concentration of flowering plants. So it's a good spot to look for unusual stuff that might kind of just be there for a day and pass on. Uh, Buckeye is a butterfly that's seen there almost every year, once or twice. Um, but some of the more common ones, uh, Red Admiral, very familiar butterfly to many of us. Uh, we do get uh, um, Milberts and Compton tortoiseshell. Uh, again, very unusually, but I think every year we'll get a couple of spectacular Milbert's tortoise shell. Uh, more commonly, there's question marks and comma in the garden, uh, named for their marks on the hind wing. This, of course, is a question mark. Comma would not have the dot there. You can even tell them from above. Um, it's easier when, they're, when their wings are closed to sort of get your binoculars and look for the mark. But from above, you can count the dark marks on the forewing. Um, I'm pointing at my screen here. but. You see that this one has three, these five dots and that one larger mark. This is an Eastern comma. Question mark has the same five dots and the larger mark. And then it's kind of a bar at the left end of the dots uh, serving as a, uh, an additional mark there, seventh uh, dot. So yeah, if you could just see it open from above, they're very similar. There's some other differences, but that's one way to tell them apart. Morning cloak, another familiar brush foot. Um, some of these butterflies will overwinter as adults. Uh, Bill was mentioning the warm weather, probably more so into March. If we get a if we get a mild March, the butterfly garden could have butterflies as early as the second or third week of March, and that would be uh, this butterfly here, morning cloak, or eastern comma. They will overwinter as adults and come out and fly around in, on those warm March days. Uh, Baltimore checker spot has been seen a few times at the garden. Uh, we do get American lady and uh, painted lady, very similar species as well. Numbers of these, some of these butterflies are very unpredictable. Some years there'll be tons of, of ladies around, American ladies around, and other years there'll be very few. Other stray is the snout. But more commonly in the garden, we see things like crescents, uh, great spangled fertility, almost always there through the summer. Viceroy, there's a lot of willows along the bank, which is their host plant. There's always some viceroys along the bank there. Uh, monarch butterfly, monarch caterpillars. I uh, will stop here and, and talk about some of the issues in the garden. Um, obviously in a public space, uh, most people are 
are very excited to be there and very welcome to be there. But over the years, there's been some sort of latent issues at the garden. One is a common one is a theft of monarch caterpillars. Um, there's an interest in people raising butterflies and at home and at schools. And regardless of how uh, people feel about the pros and cons of that, it, it's kind of unacceptable to, to steal from, from a wild space, especially one that's designed as a sort of education and conservation space in, in a natural setting. Um, it's kind of been this low level of, of theft, some of it maybe innocently and, and people coming and cutting milkweed because th that they know they can get it there. But um, anyways, I just sort of wanted to respectfully say that, I, mean, I don't know, we discourage this theft of theft of caterpillars, theft of pupae, theft of plants. Um, stuff like that happens at the garden as it happens anywhere. For the most part, it's a very positive interaction with visitors there, but um, it's kind of an expected thing every year that something like this will happen. And because of this, that aside, it makes it difficult at times to, to, to show people things in the garden, to run an education program. 99% um, of folks visiting the garden want to see stuff, but there's always a sort of fear that if you show interesting or unusual stuff, that it will disappear. So uh, it comes, sort of comes with running a public space, but um, we do plant large swaths of milkweed um, and we do point out monarch uh, caterpillars and some other caterpillars to folks. Um, again, a major focus of the garden is, is encouraging uh, the populations of monarch butterflies and encouraging others to do the same at home. So uh, brushwits are not all the spectacular orange, big sort of monarch-esque species that we all know and love. There's some smaller ones, sort of drab ones as well that we get in the garden, wood nymph, uh, ringlet, little wood satyr. We get butterflies kind of through from May all the way, or sorry, from March if we get adults, but typically kind of mid-May through late September. And because we're next to Canal Park, we also get some butterflies that frequent more open uh, meadowy areas like that. We get red spotted admirals. Uh, they're easily confused with the swallowtails if they're unfamiliar, but they lack the, the swallow tails. Tiger swallowtail, very common in the butterfly garden throughout the summer, May, right through the midsummer. See this photo was taken probably in May when the lilacs are blooming. Black swallowtail, maybe I would say from the, of the sort of big recognizable butterflies, black swallowtail is probably the most common, reliable butterfly to see in the garden. There's always cabbage whites there, but black swallowtail always, almost every day in the summer, there's a couple of black swallowtails around, very prominent, chasing each other around, laying eggs in the garden, big star. Occasionally we'll get a spice bush swallowtail. Luckily we have a spice bush planted for them to lay eggs on, which has happened the last couple of summers. Once there was a pipe vine swallowtail release in the garden, uh, somebody who'd raised a bunch of them released a bunch. So as far as I know, I think that's the only time they've been seen, but we do have a, a host plant for the pipe vine swallowtail. So, because our uh, summers and autumns are becoming sort of more warm and longer, there's a chance they'll be seen in the garden. And of course the, Giant small tails, the star of the garden. Um, this is the one that inspired Joanna to start the butterfly garden. They're often seen, but they're sort of unpredictably seen. Um, kind of be there one day and not the next. They're kind of enigmatic for such an enormous butterfly, but um, it just seems to be the way with them. The, you can see them every year in August, July, August, but it just seems to be the way. We'll see one one day and then it'll appear a week later. And, they kind of wander far and wide, it seems. Whites and sulfurs, cabbage whites are kind of white noise at the garden. There's always a dozen or so around. Um, we do get clouded and orange sulfur as well. So these are the butterflies that if you're maybe new to, uh, to butterflies, they may not be as familiar. Um, hair streaks are, um, they're kind of easy to spot in the garden because they have this habit of sitting in the center of flowers and kind of just rotating almost like a little sundial. 
and occasionally there'll be a big hatch and there'll be 10 or 15 or 20 uh, banded or striped hair streaks just sitting in the middle of the flowers in the garden um, for a brief period, typically late June, early July. So while they seem small and drab, their, their habits and their behavior make them easy to see and easy to recognize. So if you visit the garden at that time, check the tops of the flowers, they'll often fly up together and zoom around in circles and come back down. Um, and I remember maybe five years ago, there was a massive hatch of them in the garden area. And I think we had 70 or 80 banded hair streaks just on a couple flowers in the garden. So um, again, something to, to sort of keep interest in early July with uh, blues throughout the year, spring and summer azures. Um, this is a species, Eastern tail blue, which is actually somewhat infrequently seen in the garden, but almost always seen at Canal Park. Their host plant is sort of abundant along the trails at Canal Park. So if you, if you wander through that section connecting Canal Park and, and just search the edges of the trail and the plants there, I've seen 15, 10, 15, 20 Eastern tail blues there before, um, but they're very infrequently seen right in the garden. Uh, skippers, we have uh, we have intentionally planted a lot of the garden to attract skippers, and not only to attract them, but to give visitors the opportunity to see them. Uh, and we've done this by planting a lot of herbs, like like creeping thyme and stuff like that, and native flowers along the edge of the garden, along the edge of the path, along the edge of the rocks. Allowed them to sort of creep along and, and, and trail over the rocks, uh, because skippers are tough. They're small. They're fast. Um, people aren't familiar with them if they're new to, to butterflies. Um, and with so many hundreds and thousands of flowers close together, a species that's small and sort of skittish won't really go far. They, they won't always take off and go 100 feet away like a swallowtail. They might just kind of go six feet and come back down, um, providing people an opportunity to see and, and photograph them and learn about something that kind of might otherwise be inaccessible if, if all the plants were were up in the garden and all the skippers just looked like little tiny things. Um, so it's an intentional element of design, which, which has reaped, which people have been able to, um, sorry, which visitors have been able to reap the benefits of this design. Uh, this is a silver spotted skipper, um, a larger skipper, perhaps our most common skipper at the garden. It's fiery skippers is very, very sought after. Again, a rare stray in August, September, people visit the garden. Um, might be the most common question we get from visitors in August. Are there any fiery skippers? Um, often there are for a week or so in the fall. Um, I guess they kind of look like, like the sort of sparks from a bonfire on, on the hindwing there. Here's a, here's a better look, like the glowing embers of a fire. Uh, we get other skippers frequently, tawny edge skipper. Peck skipper, very common. Occasionally we'll get a uh, Leonard skipper. Again, you can see all these little, this is just one flower head of a, of a butterfly bush, but there's many hundreds and thousands of flowers close together. So a small butterfly like a skipper doesn't have to go far and wide to search for flower to flower. Um, so it allows visitors a chance to view them for long periods. You can see the same with the other skippers. They're on these flower heads that have many little florets on them. Uh, we get wild indigo dusky wing laying eggs in the garden. Another rare visitor is a common city wing. Um, but again, I, I think almost every year that I can recall, there's one or two city wing in the garden. They're very unusual and kind of hard to find and low, but something to look for. They kind of have this salt and pepper look to the wings. All right, uh, very infrequently do we, people go to the garden in the evening, or sorry, at night, but there's a lot of moths to be seen during the day and in the early morning and in the evening. Um, very spectacular species have been seen, both as caterpillars and adults. Eight spotted forest, forester moths are pretty common there. The white line sphinx moth. There's a lot of plume moths around of different species. I think this is the Pandora sphinx caterpillar, the 
the screen one that was here at the beginning. So yeah, uh, on the sort of edges of a lot of the trees, especially around the garden, um, and especially on the, on the south side of the garden, there's a big natural area with mostly, mostly grapevines and this big grape tangle along the bank of the canal. A lot of these species are, um, aside from the obvious uh, larger trees along the bank, a lot of these species feed on things like Virginia creeper and wild grape. Um, so a lot of the moss in the garden come from these wild areas. This is a confused haploa, I believe. I know Bill likes moths, so you could correct me after if, if any of these moths are wrong. Mint, mint moths, pretty common in the garden. The tussock moth, caterpillars. Um, we get Nessus sphinx moth. These are often around, very, uh, very attractive moth. Look at these two yellow bands on the, on the abdomen there. These are also moths. We get some of the clear wing borer moths. Um, they're actually pretty common. Um, squash vine borer and some of these other clear wing moths. Um, sort of see them frequently in the garden, just kind of resting. All right, so I noticed also uh, in the back of the wood duck, hopefully many of you have seen it, there's a, there's a couple of pages highlighting the photo contest. This has been something that we've been running for a number of years now. There's a summer photo contest um, and the winter photo contest. There's kind of two separate animals. Um, the winter photo contest is run in conjunction uh, with the Hamilton Conservation Authority. Um, and, and, it, and the boundaries are also Canal Park, sort of allow entrance to take advantage of the wintering waterfowl and the winter scenes at Canal Park. Um, the summer photo contest is focused more on the wildlife in the garden proper. Um, so obviously with the change of seasons and change of, of boundaries, the, um, the photos that we get each contest are very different and they're very spectacular. Um, I, I will mention that uh, in the wood duck, it says all entries judged by Matt Mills. Um, I, I do, I do help in the photo contest. I design the entry form and I sort of sort the photos as they come in. But if anyone's trying to look up my home address because they're mad they lost, um, I don't actually judge the photo contest. I forward the photos to the panel of judges where they're um, where they're judged. Um, so I noticed in the in the wood duck. It, frequent, it shows some of the winners. I'll show some more of them here in a moment. But um, I wanted to invite anyone uh, to, to join the Winter Photo Contest. There's a couple of weeks left. Uh, all of the rules and the entry form are on urquhartbutterfly.com, um, right on the website. As soon as you enter, there, there's information on the photo contest. Um, so yeah, there's two categories, birds and other wildlife and natural winter scenes. You can do close-ups of plants, kind of more of a broad landscape shot. Um, there's quite a bit of birds in the canal, um, and that's changing every day with the spring coming on early. So there are cash prizes, and we do post many of the winning photographs online. So invite anyone uh, of any age or skill level to, to please feel welcome to enter the photo contest. Some of our past winners uh, in the different categories Posted first or second or um, honorable mention, this uh, hummingbird clearwing moth, one of the winners for butterflies and moths in the summer contest, birds and other wildlife. Excuse me, I don't think this photo, I think maybe one second place, but this is this is one of my favorite photos ever from the butterfly garden. Really spectacular image of a red-bellied woodpecker. Uh, insects and other invertebrates, plants and flowers. So the summer has, has a category for everyone, um, regardless of your interest, to enter the photo contest. Uh, and we have flowers throughout the season. These are some fall flower anemone. So the garden has, has flowers and wildlife right from, right from March, right into October and November, and winter interest in the canal. So I wanted to talk about the future of the butterfly garden. I mentioned Joanna Chapman was a driving force beyond the the, the creation of the garden and the maintenance of the garden. She's really been active all 30 years of the garden. Um, a lot of the garden, uh, a lot of the garden has been driven by Joanna's sort of will to make it go, her own time, her, her own funding. Before the garden was funded, 
she did a lot of the funding from her private uh, her private money. Um, she's been responsible for hiring people to go there and or to work there, and really involving Michelle Sharp in the garden. Uh, Michelle has been a real godsend designing all of the visuals for the connect for the for the website, for the kiosk, for a lot of the promotional material, for the signs, um, anything that really looks pretty other than the design of the garden itself is, is Michelle. Um, but going forward, the Urquhart Butterfly Garden is going to be in the hands of the Hamilton Naturalist Club, um, kind of secured a, a steady future for the garden. Um, but we're looking for people to be involved. There's all sorts of ways to be involved, uh, teaching a summer course, uh, weeding the garden, pruning the garden. There's there's paid work and volunteered work. Um, obviously, Joanna at some point will be looking for someone to to take on a role of overseeing the garden, hiring people to work there. Um, the garden needs creative input going forward. Each year, kind of, there's portions of the garden that start from scratch. Uh, so, if you're interested in landscaping or um, wildlife interpretation, uh, gardening, anything like that. Um, management of, of employees. Uh, I, I can't speak to exactly how the club will be doing things. Um, I think Jen Baker and, and members of the club will know better, but in the immediate future, 2023, the garden's always looking for volunteers, even just an hour a day during the week or on a Saturday morning, if you wanted to come and, and prune or pull some weeds or uh, um, there's other maintenance to be done at the garden, trail maintenance to be done there. Um, but also all visitors are welcome. The gardens are the gardens really exploded the last, I would say, five years with the photo contest. And I would say also with the pandemic, people being interested in, in hiking and wildlife and photography. Um, it's really a core of, of photographers that are often in the garden, um, very passionate photographers. It is, it's a wonderful opportunity to go and do um, like, macro photography or insect photography or just observe wildlife so um i just wanted to put it out there that anybody is welcome at the garden um and i hope to see you there uh if there are any questions i think uh they'll be managed in the chat here and happy to answer any of them thanks very much matt that was that was excellent I really like that uh, talk you gave. Of course, the, the garden is the garden is about butterflies, but there's so much more there. And for such a a small area, all the things that you can see there, especially with the addition of the uh, canal park area, and a lot of that is planted with um, with wildflowers that are really good pollinators, pollinator plants, good for butterflies and bees it's it's really quite a spectacular area to visit and to see you know lots of different things at um, at all times of year in the winter time you're not going to see any insects of course but uh, just all the the waterfowl that can be there and the other land birds and the beavers the beavers are a nice addition of course the beavers have already always been there but this year the beavers are being uh, being a bit more of a problem, I guess, although it's, are, are they a problem or I guess we just have to learn to uh, accept them. <laughs> so um, we have a few uh, questions. Um, does the garden have problems uh, with Japanese beetles? And if you do have problems, how do you deal with them? Sure. Uh, before I answer that, I, I will say I think the issue with the beavers is I think there's some obstruction at the other end of the canal, which is typically they kind of travel back and forth by some manner to, uh, I don't know if they cross the road or, or how to, into the marsh proper. And I haven't been down there to look, but some folks have told me that there's some obstruction there for some reason, and the beavers are kind of just in the canal. So I don't I don't know I think it's kind of fascinating what's going on down there but I think typically they're there and they kind of move back and forth um yeah so I mean I can answer that question and extend it uh further 
obviously in any garden setting, there's going to be pests, like a invasive species or, or species that are kind of do damage. Um, this garden is different in that it's designed to absorb damage. Uh, we're sort of feeding the wildlife, but uh, Japanese beetles can be a huge problem. Um, I know, uh, I mean, there's no pesticides used. So anything that's like that is kind of just physically sort of picked off and put in a bucket. Um, we're fortunate at the garden that, as I mentioned on the one side, there's a huge swath of wild grape. And uh, I don't know if it attracts them to the garden, but it seems to absorb a lot of the, like the brunt of the damage. There's, there's things that they seem to prefer. Um, and I've noticed that in years where there's a lot of them, that a lot of the sort of damage that they do isn't on, isn't on stuff that's sort of high, highlighted in the garden for folks to visit or see to attract other wildlife. Um, I mean, if you're Joanna, you just pick them up in your hand and like squish them, but <laughs> that's not for everyone. There, there's, sometimes there's mechanical control done on stuff like that. Um, I don't recall, I don't recall ever seeing any sort of sort of pheromone, anything like that in the garden. I, I think anything I've seen has always been the kind of off doing their own thing in areas that aren't really important. So, but it is a good question. Yeah, so Matt, I know they, from experience, the Japanese beetles love uh, riverbank grape because I've got a bit of it growing in my garden. It, it wasn't planted, but I haven't taken it out. But yeah, it seems like if you've got some riverbank grape in your garden, you don't have to worry about the Japanese beetles so much because the Japanese beetle will gravitate to the riverbank grape, which um, can take a whole lot of defoliation and just keep sending out new shoots and new shoots. So, yeah, like that, I don't think I could have said it better than that. Like that's exactly it. Works, it. <laughs> it works well. Um, there was another question. Um, let's see if I can find it here. There's something about, um, you know, here it is, uh, white turtle head, uh, which is, I just know what it is, turtle head, but I guess the, maybe the proper name is white turtle head Chalone glabra. Yes. Uh, one, of the, one of the larval hosts of uh, the Baltimore, the Baltimore checker spot, is, is that planted in the garden? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the checker spot's only been seen there twice and uh, knowing what I know, sort of where there's concentrations of them in the, in the region, like it doesn't seem like they're all that close. I, butterflies kind of wander around, but in the past there's been small patches of of turtle head there, but nothing more than that. No, no sort of big significant planting of them. Um, I know they sort of like like wetter soil, so that might be sort of part of the reason that hasn't thrived there. But um, yeah, in the past there's been sort of small patches of turtle head, but nothing, nothing kind of major that would host like a small population of Baltimore. But maybe something for a passing butterfly to lay an egg on. Yeah. That's, well, I mean, I think it just, um, the fact that you got Baltimore's there bespeaks the fact that butterflies wander. And I guess it's just part of their natural history to find uh, new habitats to colonize just by, for whatever reason, just taking off from where, where they hatch. Um, and of course, where they hatch is usually suitable habitat, but as part of how species work to, you know, colonize new habitats. So I've seen it in, in my yard too, where I'm in a very urban environment. And um, two years in a row, I had a, a broad wing skipper in the yard, which was, I don't know why I, I'd, I'd ever get a broad wing skipper in my backyard, but for two years in a row, it was just a, an incredible fluke. Well, so that's uh, like, lots of comments here about to Matt your um, your presentation and uh, how well it was done, how uh, informative it was. Um, don't Thanks, everybody. Other, <laughs> don't know if there's any other. Let me check. Um, I'm looking there's at. Question, there's, a there's a question about Centennial Park, sort of an anonymous. Oh yeah, here we are. Yeah, I'll, I'll read that off. A lot of stakeholders are working together in this area, and I'm curious about the role of the City of Hamilton 
what role they play in Centennial Park specifically. Are they being echo conscious of the space as you'd like them to be? So I can't really comment on that. Well, this is actually a good question. It's sort of actually a part of being involved with the Butterfly Garden is working with the city of Hamilton. The, I mean, obviously Centennial Park is where the Butterfly Garden is. And while it may sort of seem like a separate entity, like it, it only is based on like how the land is used. Um, the, the parking lot is the city of Hamilton municipal lot. One of the things that, that they've done is, I know recently the, the park there, I don't, I don't know, in the last decade or whatever, there, there's been a big planting of cherry trees as a gift from the sister city of Dundas uh, in Japan. Um, and so the sort of mowing has kind of changed there. And one of the things that the city of Hamilton has done is they've worked with the butterfly garden to not mow the strip, the last like hundred feet of grass that's between the park and the garden. There's a few like crab apple and apple trees there. And there's that like, there's the cedar hedge that I mentioned that kind of buffers the winds from the garden. And in the fall, a lot of those crab apples are left kind of to sort of spill on the ground because they attract butterflies. That's, we've had Compton tortoiseshell there feeding on the uh, sort of rotting fruit. Um, and I can't really speak to, it's a good question. I said, it's more complex question than I can get after, but I can't really speak to the rest of it, but I know they've kind of allowed that, that buffer zone and staff of the garden kind of cares for the grass, like they mow it and they, as they see fit um, between the garden and the park proper. Whereas previously they would just kind of go through there with the mowers and mow the whole thing. So there's an, there's an area in between. Um, yeah, and, and if there's issues there, um, the city works with the garden. But um, I can't speak to how they, they treat the park itself. Like a, if you're asking if they spray the grass there, um, that would sort of be mitigated by this buffer zone. But um, anyways, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, there's another question here relating to the, um, the turtle head. Is there room to build a small bog garden where you could plant turtle head as a food source for the checker spot? Well, I mean, there's this sort of room at the garden to do whatever. I mean, all, all the butter, all the beds are um, like, like, like we saw, like the center of all the beds have these foundation plantings of trees and shrubs. And then the rest is kind of open to interpretation. The only, the only thing that would prevent something like that would be sort of what the drainage is like at the garden, right? So there might have to be additional work. Like it's just soil plopped between these stones, right? So sort of additional work on the drainage. That could yeah. be something that, hmm? it'd, be, it'd be very tough to get a self-sustaining population of Baltimore checker spots going there. Even That's, if you had, uh, yeah, even if you had a I lot of, say that. even if you had a lot of white turtle head, just the way butterfly, butterfly populations kind of sort of bust and bloom that um, you could actually get a population going there and then and then parasites and predators could wipe it out in just one season. So it's um, not as easy as it sounds to, and it's a lot of it's a lot of work. From what I know about just butterflies in general, um, even populations I think in natural areas of a fair size, my sense is they get wiped out every once in a while, and then they have to be recolonized later by you know, an influx of more indiv individuals to come back to that location. I think I've noticed that before with other butterflies where with certain species where you'll, you'll be in a spot for a few years and then all of a sudden they're not there anymore. And you're yeah, checking- Yeah, like sometimes, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't say this to like be derisive or to make fun of anyone, but so, sometimes at, at events in the summer at the butterfly garden, people will, I've had this presented several times, like, well, what if what if we got like all the unusual butterflies and let them go in the garden which which sounds great like but it, to your point like it doesn't really work and I, i'm not making fun of people i just mean like if we got like all the rare butterflies in ontario and like let them go there they would just like fly away but uh um yeah the garden is is so small and so kind of diverse that it, it obviously is designed to provide wildlife habitat and sustain some populations Obviously, there's a population of, say, 
peck skippers there that are kind of always there. But uh, it, it really is designed to sort of advocate for these practices and to sort of teach people that like, if, if everyone had a little clump of habitat like this, then there, there would be like this network of habitat across the landscape. Like if everyone had a little butterfly garden in their yard, then these areas of wild habitat where there are sort of self-sustaining populations of things like, like Baltimore, if they wandered across the landscape, they could kind of find food and maybe find a small place to lay their eggs. But nobody's really suggesting that like our backyards could host like burgeoning populations of unusual wildlife, but the sort of network of connected habitat serves to sort of aid. Right. Yeah, so uh, anyways. I wonder how close uh, to the Urquhart Butterfly Garden, the closest sort of self-sustaining population of Baltimore's would be. I mean, I can't really think yeah, of that. Yeah, maybe in Flam maybe in Coots Paradise somewhere in Flamborough. I, 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 I Poss possibly Coots Paradise. That it is possible they could be in Coots Paradise, so which isn't too far away. But uh, so, anyways, it's a it's a good question. I don't I don't mean to sort of. Yeah, I mean it's just that uh, there's so much to know about natural history that I can understand why people would think that you know we can establish populations of butterflies in an area that small. Just it just doesn't work. I mean, the, the, the garden is, is fantastic as a resource for seeing butterflies, educating people about butterflies and other insects. And I think it's, um, I think that's the component too, that is, you know, that's enlightened people just to get involved in nature. And then when they get involved in nature, then they tend to want to protect nature too. So, and be advocates. So the butterfly garden has, done its job and Joanna has done a great job and Matt you've done a great job in assisting her over the years in maintaining the garden. I should point out to everybody that Matt has helped to um, maintain the garden for a lot of years not just the hikes that he does and the talks that he does but as a, actually as a gardener so not everybody should be aware of that. So um, I'll see if there's any more questions here. Okay, I think that's the end of the question. I guess I have one question for you. Uh, what would you say is the rarest butterfly that's ever turned up there? Or maybe you might just want to say the top two or three rare butterflies. Oh, geez. Uh, well, the, the rarest butterfly, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> The rarest butterfly I think that's been seen there was a, a sachem skipper. Um, right. uh, I recall, again, like this is kind of funny since since I, I think it was 2012, August 2012. I went there one afternoon just to look for butterflies and stumbled upon this skipper. I think it was one of the first ones seen in Hamilton, and I, I got all excited and I and I went home and like, got on my computer and posted on. Uh, like uh, there's a list serve in Hamilton, many folks may know, like post butterfly and dragonfly sightings. And I wrote, there's a sachem at the garden and I sent it and I got a reply like right away from Alan Wormington, what garden? And, and <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. And then half an hour later, I think Brian Wiley said, there's one in my backyard too. And so like, I don't know, I'm kind of laughing about it, but um, I think those, and then Bob Curry had one in Burlington. I think those were the first ones seen in, in Hamilton, those kind of clusters. Yeah, that was, I think that was, that was the only year that they ever, I think that's the only year they've occurred in Hamilton that year. Yeah, so that was a yeah, really was, spectacular one. Yeah, it, and that's the way it is with, with stray butterflies. They often do show up. I mean, you can get just singletons, but they often do uh, show up in groups. Because uh, I know there was, there was at least one, you know, the aforementioned Alan Warmington, he saw one in Brantford at uh, Lauren Park, and, and uh, they were seen at uh, Shell Park in Oakville. They're, that's where I saw them. There were there were a few there. Uh, I went specifically to see them. So, um, yeah, it's just how these populations work sometimes uh, every once. And it's the same with fiery skippers, right? Fiery skippers don't overwinter in Ontario. They just come in as strays every year. It's just one of those species that tends to stray into Ontario like two years out of three. So that's the only reason we see it. They get 
they get killed yeah. off every year. So yeah, I mean, uh, I, like fiery skipper, buckeye, uh, snout. They're seen almost every year, every couple of years at the garden. Michelle Sharp and some of the people who frequent the garden almost always are the ones to find them. Um, but yeah, like th there's often an influx of butterflies early in the spring and then in July when all the sort of regular species hatch. But the garden has really been a great spot in August and September for strays. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. I know there's one other crazy butterfly, but I'm not going to remember. Th those ones well, are the, I mean, the, the pipe vine swallowtail was pretty good oh yeah somebody came and released like a whole batch of them there. oh i see yeah that one wasn't naturally occurring huh. but they certainly could be because they have occurred in the hamilton area um they, maybe they occur one out of five years somebody's lucky enough to see one here or there oh we do have one question here that just came in do deer make it into the garden I'm sure they must. You know what, before I answer, I, I think there was a variegated fertility found dead at the garden oh, yeah. one time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, Matt, I, I'm sure variegated <laughs> fertility. There were times where, there was a couple of years where variegated fertilities were pretty common. So I'm, I'm maybe it was a year where you were working somewhere else in the garden. I'm sure yeah. that must have been a year where there were quite a few variegated fertilities in the garden. So but that, but that is a rare butterfly in most years, for sure. Yeah, like the 10 years ago when there was sort of that cluster of years, but de there's deer, uh, there's a lot of deer actually across Coots Drive. Um, and occasionally there's deer in the garden. Typically they do the, the same damage every time. Um, they seem to really like the the um, red osier dogwood when it's sort of like fresh and budding out. So kind of like the beavers, they'll do extensive damage, but like it's not really damage everything will just kind of sprout back. Um, I've not noticed them to come in and sort of devastate the flowers in the garden. They seem to really just like browsing all the shrubs. So occasionally you'll see footprints, occasionally in the mornings you'll see a deer standing in the garden, but um, I know some of the lilacs are protected from the deer in the spring, but yeah, otherwise, no. Nah. It doesn't seem to be a massive issue, just if you go there one morning and see like all the dogwoods mowed to the ground, like it's probably the deer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, Matt. Uh, 